The thing is, that shows up when I leave, I would have left three years ago. <laughs> but you only show up at the sensitive moments. There's a lot of khayran. That's the most kind of time. That's the efforts of the uh, uh, MSAs, all at SAID, UFC, and uh, MRU, the few of them who arranged this lecture. I had no intention to share it, but يعني, they did all the effort in bringing it all together. And subhanAllah, in that one, I don't know who, who designed the poster. Oh, yeah, I didn't no need to write a final lecture. <laughs> and then you capitalize it. <laughs> so dramatic. Too bad you might try to come back to you soon. Oops. Inshallah, <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> I have many messages, honestly, to share with you. A lot of things that I learned personally in these three years that have touched and made a connection with each and every person in Calgary specifically. And alhamdulillah, يعني, around the area, and people who have never seen me, who have never been in this quadrant, and that connection was, connection was built. And this is what drove my experience here, which would be a mission impossible to just encapsulate it all in one hour that we have today. But the one thing that I found out before I speak to the youth directly, even though I see many unyouth faces right here, but mashallah, Abu Mu'ayyad is a youth, the Ali in the spirit. Allahumma barik. The one thing that I realized about communities that they don't need a scholar. They don't need a shaykh. Someone who spent 10 years finishing his PhDs and masters and finished all the books of knowledge and fiqh and tafsir, they don't need that. And this is something for the leaders of the community to understand and look for those who will guide the communities. But they need someone who speaks the language of people. Let me rest assure you here, and I give you a fully guaranteed affirmation that Rasulullah wasallam did not have a single degree in Sharia. He didn't pursue his social studies in UC. He didn't finish even a PhD. He didn't write one thesis about one of the authentic books, one of the, uh, the, prophet, the prophets, about Ibrahim or Musa or Isa. He didn't have that knowledge at all. But the one thing that Rasulullah had is the relationship. Those gained skills that he had in the community. That when you speak to him one-to-one, -one, without any knowledge, without fiqh and tafsir and hadith, you would feel that you relate to him. You would feel like, hey, this person understands where I'm coming from. Listen, if you were an orphan, he was an orphan. He, he, he can speak to you about it. He, can, he, he was on your shoes one day. If you were a poor man struggling with your life and paying your pelt, your rents and your debts, he was a poor man. Aisha says there were days passed by Rasulullah month after month after month and he didn't have a solid dish being cooked at his house. If you're a rich man and you have mansions and Lamborghinis and houses, he was rich and a businessman as well. If you are a refugee who's coming from Syria, Afghanistan, Gaza, Pakistan, whatever, he is a refugee. So that when you speak to him, you would feel so connected. And this is why he was the most successful leader in a community. Rasulullah with his personality and being very down to earth. And this is the one thing, Wallah. And in the last three weeks, I've received many messages of love. They ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep that love, that I didn't work for it. It was all founded and fashioned and bonded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to many community members, especially the youth. And when they write the long messages, which they express their feelings and they open up like, no tomorrow. Brother, I'll see you tomorrow, so don't get too comfortable with me. <laughs> and then they start talking, not about the lectures that you gave, not about the knowledge, not about the tafsir sessions, not about the lectures that you see, but about that one day, Shaykh when you spoke one to one to me. That one day, when we had a little chap in the corner, that one day changed my relationship with you. SubhanAllah. Abu Hurairah says, كانت المرأة إذا أتت من البادية A woman would come from far away in the Bedouin. She would come in the Bedouin, in the, in the Bedouin area. She would come to the masjid 
فكانت تجلب رسول الله من بيننا حتى يقضي حاجتها فيعود إلينا. Look how easy access people had to رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. They would come to the masjid, grab him in the middle of a council, of a session, and they would talk to him, speak to him, chat to him, until they get what they want, and he goes back. This is why Amr ibn Asq thought that he is the most beloved person to Rasulullah. He came in the famous hadith and asked him, Man ahabu nasi ilayk? Who is the most beloved to you? Everyone thought that Rasulullah loves you the most. But, you're not even that, not even in the top five, we're top ten lists. Aisha, and then Abu Bakr, and then Umar, and then Ali, and then Uthman. Amr ibn al was surprised, I'm not there. So how, how do you treat me that nicely? And this is exactly what we need. And I wish and I hope that that will lead that. Because I asked the youth, hey, come and join us in the activities. Come and join us, Shaykh. I don't have the knowledge. Shaykh, Allah, I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, it's not about the knowledge. It's about you. Acting as a leader, following the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu and putting your impact as Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did it. It doesn't need knowledge. It doesn't need sharia. It doesn't need you to memorize and read the six authentic books of hadith. No, but it's to know and understand the social skills that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had as a community. Last but not least, three by three. This is my message to you tonight. Three main problems that I found with the youth today that I dealt with in Calvary. And Allah has allowed me to be in the four corners, being at high schools, at universities, at masajid, dealing with the day-to-day -day problems, whether they come and open up personally or it's coming to me from the parents. And those three main issues exist not just in you as a youngster at 18 and 19 years, and 20 years old in their 20s, but even in the elders and any believer as well. And on the other hand, the three solutions that you will have to adopt it to solve it. The first problem that we all share and we have, especially the youth, the lack of destination. Many people, Boys and girls, they are going, but they don't know where they're going. You know Abdullah ibn Hudafat al-Sahmi? Abdullah ibn Hudafat al-Sahmi was one of the soldiers in the army of Khalid ibn Walid. Now, the king or the emperor of the Romans, he requested Khalid and he told him, send me one of your men to discuss with him, do some negotiations. Maybe we can find a middle ground instead of fighting and shedding blood, right? So he asked him, why are you coming? In I know your poor Bedouin coming to us from Mecca and Medina. If you want food, we will give you the food for a year. If you want money, we will give you. If you want to be the leaders over the Arabian Peninsula, we will give it to you. What do you want? Now look at the answer of this man. Who, what, what tells you that this man has a destination? He said, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ba'd. Faqad atayna li nukhrijakum min ibadat al ibad. Look at that statement. Don't just pass by it. Let it, uh, let it sink in for a second. We came to bring you out from worshipping the slaves to worshipping the Lord of slaves. And this is a very significant statement right now. That every one of us has many purposes has many people to please. You're trying to please your family, and please the community, and please your friends. You're trying to form many different personalities. At the end, you forget why you're even alive. It, it creates a lack of purpose, a lack of destination to you in front of you. And this is exactly what we have today. This is what the Sahaba had before the days of Rasulullah 
عليه الصلاة والسلام he came to have one destination for you, Allah. If I ask you today, why are you here in the Masjid? Your answer would be questionable. Because if you are for the sake of Allah, where were you yesterday? The day before? The week before? Where were you before Ramadan? Brothers, it's a serious, important matter because you have to always roll it around. Who inspires me? Who motivates me? Is it only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or many other factors? I was just discussing with the boys today. MashaAllah, out of love and sincerity and good intentions. The saying, the shaykh, the masjid will be dead after you. Of course it will be dead. Because there are many dead individuals like you in the community. Dead individuals who are not worshipping Allah. Worshipping Abdul Rahman. And of course, when he leaves you, leave. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring you in the day of judgment and asks you, why did you worship me? And you said, because of you, Ya Allah, surprisingly, you didn't question your heart, you were too busy. You were too busy that you come occasionally from time to time to the masjid. That you would say Allah and Allah would say, Kadabt, you're lying. Min ibadat al ibad, illa ibadat rabb al ibad. This is a whole lecture by itself, brothers. That your motivation to come today to the masjid, you were pushed by your parents. Every good that you do, it needs a motivation. Even the volunteers once, when you volunteer at the MSA, MashaAllah, you don't want any money, you don't want any work. But at the end, are you doing it for Allah or to put it in your resume? Just to write, I volunteered at 40 hours and then you give it to your employer uh, and you will find you an easy job. Why are you even volunteering? Even those things that you're not paid for, is it for ibadah to ibad or ibadah to ibad? And when you have that destination in front of you, you will truly have a lack of and a purpose of existence. You don't need someone to compliment you. You're not harmed when someone insults you, attacks you, because you know how good and bad you are. This is why Ibn Qayyim says, لا يضر المؤمن ما قيل فيه إذا عرف نفسه. And when you have that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of your eyes, you will become a bee. I always bring that example. We all have the butterfly and the bee. Both of them are beautiful flies. The butterflies are full of colors, right? It's very nice. It goes from flower to another, from flower to another. When it comes right back home, you put your hands, you want it to land on your hand, you want to touch it. It's so beautiful from the outside. But what's the impact of butterfly? Nothing. It doesn't provide anything to the community. It's a passive fly. Just like many of us here. On the other hand, another instinct, another insect, a bee, that received a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A bee has, has a destination. A bee has a purpose. Brothers, this is a serious act. When the bee received revelation from Allah and acted upon it and the only motivation is not you. Wallahi, the bees don't care about you whether you eat their honey or you don't but they're motivated and working hard for the sake of Allah. They're productive. And every one of them is an active member in the community. Sahaba had that problem by the way. Sahaba were motivated by Rasulullah The battle of Bahad. The Battle of Uhud is, is one of the greatest stories that you can ever pass by. And no matter how many enough times you read it, believe you me, you haven't got the flesh on it yet. When the rumors are spread in the battlefield that Rasulullah died, what did the Sahaba do? What did they do? They dropped the swords. They dropped the shields and the weapons. Screw it. We're not fighting. And it's a good mother comes and he asks, Malakum. Why did you throw your swords? The battle is still going on. Rasulullah died. Why would we fight? Allahu Akbar. 
Now look at the answer of Anas ibn al He said, فموتوا على ما مات عليه. Get up and die for the same cause that he died for. When you have that mentality, you will never stop fighting, even if Rasulullah, Rasulullah died. When Rasulullah truly died in Medina, what happened to the Sahaba? They stopped flipping one after the other, one after the other. Bilal himself, oh, where are you, Ya Bilal? We always bring you stories. Bilal says, لما مات رسول الله أظلمت المدينة. مدينة turned into darkness. And he stopped giving the adhan. Can you imagine? Bilal stopped giving the adhan until the day of conquering Jerusalem at the time of Umar ibn Khattab. That's almost 12, 13 years of not giving the adhan. Why? Because Rasulullah died. When we meet him in Jannah, I ask this question. Oh, Bilal, are you giving the adhan for Rasulullah or for Allah? Ah, Allah knows, only knows about his intentions, this sincere man, whom Rasulullah heard his footsteps in the Jannah. Umar ibn Khattab himself denied it and he said, whoever says Rasulullah, I will chop his neck off. But then, there is always one man in the community who has a destination for Allah. Who doesn't care even if Rasulullah dies? The flag of Islam will always be standing. And the masjid will never die. And the ummah will never collapse. And this is Abu Bakr Siddiq. There's only one Abu Bakr Siddiq of the ummah, no second for him. Rasulullah said, said, said Why? No one better than the prophets walked on earth. No one walked on earth better than Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu after the prophets. Because of such situations, brothers, he stood up and he said, Man kana ya'budu Muhammadan, fa'inna Muhammadan qadmat. And look at that. He, he even did it. Rasulullah, Abu Bakr is the most polite person to Rasulullah, but he didn't say Rasulullah because because they're connected to this man as the messenger of Allah, as the one who delivers the revelation. He said, Muhammadan, فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا قَدْمَاتِ وَمَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيُّ لَا يَعْبُدُ And whoever is worshipping Allah, Allah never dies. And then he recited a verse that Umar ibn Khattab says, وَاللَّهِ وَلَكَ أَنَّهَا أُنْزِلَتْ عَلَيْنَا الْآنِ وَاللَّهِ as it is what revealed today the verse is, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولُ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِ يَرُسُلُ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قَتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَضُرُّ اللَّهَ شَيْعًا Muhammad is no one but a messenger of Allah. If he dies or he leaves this world, he will flip with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever flips against Allah, he harms no one but himself. So the first thing is to have a destination, ya akhi. How the only motivation and inspiration to you is Allah. And you can only get to that when you understand the second problem that we have. And the second problem is selfishness. Selfishness of the youth. Today, alhamdulillah, in the creative world that we have and the corrupted education systems and the phones and the iPads, it created a very creative and smart generation. That's for a fact. Most of us here, in the very young age, you can do what your grandparents cannot do at the age of 60. You can, you can formulate uh, computer systems. Uh, you, you can speak different languages that your parents and grandparents couldn't speak. But with creativity, it creates a form of selfishness that you care about the I, about the my, about myself above the others. And this is a situation of individuals and governments. You can, subhanAllah, this يعني, formula, this phenomena has, has come out. It's not just a theoretical or just thoughts on spreading out. It's a fact. We can see it in the governments today. As you're seeing the brothers of Gaza dying and they're not opening their mouth. Because they know if they open their mouth, what will happen to them? 
Your chair will be gone and your neck will be chopped. So why would I save those brothers? Why would I put the ummah above my own interest? That's what created the lack. Priorities are messed up. And even individuals. Now today, there is a bit of awareness among us here in Canada. But when you go to Saudi, when you go to Emirat, when you go to Makkah and Medina, there's no such, such a thing as this boycotting and all of that. It's not, it's not my case, ya. They managed to create selfish people and individuals in this ummah who cared about no one except about themselves. And Rasulullah wasallam at his time, when you look at the individuals of his community, and this is again, messages, but in those messages, a little hidden gems and treasures that if we apply it, wallahi, this community will be the community of Sahaba. We can revive and turn, and turn not the city of Calgary, but Western Canada into a Muslim community. Not with force, not with war, not with pressure, but with values. And once we do that, we'll try to implement and change the forces around us. When Rasulullah came back, a woman was coming to the borders of Al Madinah. This woman, her father and her brother and her two sons were martyred in the Battle of Wahid. As she's receiving the army and they're coming to her, they asked her, she asked them, What happened? Are you victorious? Did you lose? Oh, give me the updates. And they told her, Mata Akhuki wa Ibnaiki wa Abuki, your two sons were martyred. And she's listening. Your father was martyred. And she's taking it. Your own brother was martyred. And she's taking it. Are you done? And then she said, Wa ma fa'ala Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, put those aside. What happened to Rasulullah? Ya Allah, look at me. Look at the people who are devoted. Look at the selfless people. I don't care about those. I care about my ummah. <coughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died and al khatamiyah <coughs> was crying on his grave. Umar ibn al-Khattab said, Alamat al-Kin. فَإِنَّا نَلْقَاهُ فِي الْجَنَّةِ Why are you crying? We will meet him in Jannah. قَالَتْ مَا عَلَى ذَاكَ أَبْكِي وَلَكِنْ أَبْكِي أَنْ تَوَقَّفَ الْوَحْيُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ I don't care about Rasulullah as an individual, but I care about us as an ummah. There will be no more Qur'an revealed to us. How does those people think? You know when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa speaks about Abu Bakr again, he tells his sahaba, don't you ever touch Abu Bakr. Why? Listen to the reasoning of Rasulullah. He says, فَإِنَّهُ مَا دَعَوْتُ أَحَدًا مِنْكُمْ إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ إِلَّا كَانَتْ لَهُ كَوَّا Every single one I invited to Islam, he was hesitant. He thought about it twice and thrice, except Abu Bakr. He didn't think. He believed right away. وَإِنَّهُ Listen to that. وَثَانِي حِينَ طَرَدَنِي النَّاسِ وَصَدَّقَنِي حِينَ كَذَّبَنِي النَّاسِ وَآوَانِي بِأَهْلِهِ وَمَالِهِ Now, the priorities come when you are the most needy to drop it. When you are the most sleepy and then you wake up to Salat al Fajr and you put the sleep aside. When you are the most stingy and the most needy to money and with that you donate and you give for the sake of Allah. Rasulullah recognizes Abu Bakr because he is the one who believed me when everyone denied me. Like the norm was calling me a liar and a magician and crazy. And at that time, I know that in the day of Mecca, every single one believed in me. But when it, it's the fact that we value it, it comes. When you have many options to do otherwise. Rasulullah could have said, Ya Rasulullah, just give me some time. I want to see how things go, and then I will, I will believe in you. But he believed me when everyone denied. He gave me his money and he gave me his family when well, no one would get me married. Everyone knows me in the Arabian Peninsula as a liar. And you're giving your daughter to him? You believing someone whom the leaders of Quraysh calling him a liar? Allahu Akbar. That's the priorities. 
that we're talking about. The priorities of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh radiallahu an, when, when Rasulullah told him, what do you think? Shall we go back to Medina, save our money, our families, our land, or we fight? He didn't even think twice and he says, Wallah, لو عبرت بنا هذا البحر لا عبرناه معك ما تخلنا فمنا رجل واحد. Look at that, brothers. Because many youngsters, the most pathetic answers that I received when I asked someone whom I didn't see forever, where were you? Allah Shaykh, I had assignments. I had exams. I knew you had assignments and you had exams. Everyone has us. Everyone is busy. But the question is whether you put those above Allah or you put those second. Whether you're ready to sacrifice your time and your money and your gas and you come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you always have, my time is not working. I have exams and assignments and classes and work and business and this and this and that. You're full of excuses, full of trash that will not be accepted by Allah in the day of judgment. Lack of a priorities. It's about learning. Wallahi, the only way to revive this ummah is to put Allah first. Ya Allah, I have an exam tomorrow, but guess what? I'm coming tonight to the masjid and praying. SubhanAllah. And this is something I, everyone needs a reminder, to form your schedule according to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not the pleasure of yourself. I, I, I got reminded of this one this morning, SubhanAllah. Speaking about it, and I'm, I'm lacking at it. Last night, yeah, and a group of the boys, Shaykh, leaving, we're going to sit down with you, buy you khalas. After Isha, it's too late, but they insisted, they came to my place, we had, mashallah, the tea and the coffee and all of that until almost 1 a.m. What happened to Salat al Fajr? I didn't come this morning. May Allah forgive me. I'm not showing off or bragging. But I'm telling you, but at that one moment, I put meeting the boys that are hanging out with us today. Shall I? <laughs> like I expose them. Bro, this is the last time. There's the regret that they came last night. But but at that point, I said, okay. I said, how is it? Inshallah. Like, it's, it's not a big deal. And even if I didn't, Alhamdulillah, we have Ustad Ramadi. He got my back. I put others. Above Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I would schedule myself out, and that's one out of many examples that would come to your mind. If you would put Allah, you would always form your schedule according to what pleases Him, not pleases others. The lack of destination, which is Allah, the lack of priorities, which putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, and last but not least, the selfishness, the lack of purpose. And the selfishness, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, لا ينبغي لتؤمن أن يذل نفسه A believer shall not be humiliating himself. قال يا رسول الله, how come a person will be humiliating himself? قال يحمل نفسه ما لا يطيق. Every one of us has 24 hours a day. But how did Al-Bukhari narrate it and authenticate it more than 60,000 hadith? And we can even finish, we can barely finish one book of hadith. How did he finish Quran every night in Ramadan? This was a habit for Uthman ibn Affan. You wouldn't even believe it. When you read that Uthman ibn Affan used to recite Quran every night once. That's a mission impossible to you. But how many times do you finish the Quran every night? Probably not. Probably you don't even know how to recite. Probably Quran is not even in there. Rasulullah says whoever finishes the Quran less than 40 days, at least once, he abandoned the Quran. He is among Al Hajirin. Al Hajirin, those who don't have any connection with the Quran. Why? Because it's not in your priorities. Putting the Quran first and above. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in a beautiful hadith that I will conclude those three issues with قال يا ابن آدم Listen to that carefully. يا ابن آدم خلقت الكون لك وخلقتك لي I have created this universe for you. And I created you for me. فلا تنشغل بما هو لك عمن أنت له don't get distracted with what has been created for you from what you have been created for. This is us. 
It's as if Allah knows us. You will be so invested in your work, in your friends, in your life to the point that you forget Allah. You forget the masjid. You forget the ummah and the community. And it's not your problem anymore if the masjid is active or passive. If the masjid has the sufficient donations to pay its bills and keep itself running. It's not my problem. I got lost on my plates. Now when we have all these problems, the destination and worshipping Allah for real, and that's a problem in Aqeedah, and a very serious issue in sincerity. When you are not selfish, and you're putting yourself second, and the Ummah always first, and Rasulullah gave his life for it, what did you give? And at the last, at the last but not least, what was the last one? What's that? Selfishness. Subhanallah. I look at these faces and beautiful. I forget, I forget my name now. <laughs> the lack of priorities and the selfishness, which both are yani, two faces for one coin. Those are the three main problems that makes the community of Calgary, almost 100,000 Muslims around the four corners. But yet, we're having a problem in delivering the da'wah. We're having emptiness in our masajid. And a lack of connection between the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the youth. The three solutions to those, if you recognize these issues, which a Dr. Yasser al-Huzaymi, in a beautiful, a beautiful lecture, talking with the problems of the youth, he says, everyone should pass through three stages. Three stages of a ta'allum, wa ta'allum, wa ta'aqlum. First of all, a ta'allum, the pain. The pain of what? The pain of putting yourself second and putting the community first. The point of waking up to Fajr. The point, the point, what is the point? The pain of sacrificing yourself and putting it second. This is painful. You would never reach Ahadun Ahad until you pass and go through what Bilal ibn Mabah go through. You would never reach Sabran ala yasir minna ma'idakum al jannah unless you lose your parents just like Ammar lost his parents. Huh? And you see that you lose something. You sacrifice something for the sake of Allah. You will never reach in qalaha faqad sadaq. What Abu Bakr Siddiq Allah said, if Rasulullah said that he is a truthful, until you go to, through the pain that Abu Bakr Siddiq, pain that you're ready to take it. And then through the pain you learn, you learn that Allah is the one who got your ultimate happiness, your ultimate satisfaction. Why to worry? Who cares if the whole community rejects you? I don't feel I relate. Who cares? People don't love me. Who cares about it? As long as Allah cares about you, as Allah loves you. Umar Khattab says the fundamental rule. Wallahi la ubali. Aasbahtu ala ma uhibbu am ala ma akrah. Fa inni la adri al khayru fi ma ahbabtu am kareet. Wallahi, I don't care if I wake up on something I love or I hate. Why? Because Allah is programmed by destiny. And if Allah has your destiny, why would you worry? We have gone through the names of Allah that should connect you to Him, that should relate you to Him. At ta'alim. You learn that your rizq in the hands of Allah. So why would you be afraid and worried about your employer holding your rizq back? All of these meanings get you into the stage of learning. You learn after the pain. And last but not least, to get used and be part of the ummah. The one for the whole and the whole for the one. At the aqdum, getting used to that. When the Muslims migrated from Medina, from Mecca to Medina, they were not used to the, to the, to the weather of Medina, to the people. They felt isolated. And this is why Rasulullah did two things. The first one is a dua. Allahumma habbib ilayna al-Madina ka habbina Mecca aw ashadda habba. Look at that dua. So you should make probably to your own community or to Calgary if you don't feel 
like an essential part of this masjid. You don't feel, MashaAllah, I see many faces here, but how many volunteers did we have in Ramadan? Huh? How many? How many did we have? We have one of the volunteers over there. Six? Eleven? Eleven? Four in Akram Jura. Look at that! Reckless community. Everyone, eleven. Where are all these faces? Sheikh, I have a thought. I, I, I have this on both sides and the soup and the menti and the biryani and the rice. I'm not coming all the way to stand two hours in nice cold season weather. Selfishness. You're not ready to give yourself out. And this is why the pain, you should go through the pain. And then learn from it and then get you the retort of the ummah. And this is just one example out of many. Many. How many people? Wallahi, one of the most successful examples that we have in this question. A group of the boys who run the Friday Youth Hadamah. This was running since probably yeah, the days of uh, the days of Nuh alayhi <laughs> salam. It doesn't stop. And who's running it? 15 plus years. Who's 15 plus years? A group of the youth who just committed to themselves. We want to gather every Friday and deliver something. It's not deep fiqh, it's not deep math, it's not deep physics, but we will gather, we will share one verse, one hadith, a discussion, a circle, and it's growing now gradually. They have started it. Now imagine every single one of us here acted like an active member, felt the pain and learned and merged himself into the community. Wallahi, you don't even need an imam. You don't need an imam. Just like when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died and the ummah was even stronger. Allah. The real expansion of Islam wasn't at the time of Rasulullah. At Rasulullah's time it was Mecca and Medina and Ta'if. That's it. But when you leave behind you soldiers who can shake the ground, you know that this Islam is going above and beyond. But when you're leaving behind you reckless, wicked, weak people, whom you cannot even you cannot even trust them to drive your car rather than driving a whole community. This is the outcome. And Rasulullah used to work on that a lot. When Rasulullah came to Ali ibn Abi Talib and he told him, Ya Ali, in the Adrukaid al Islam. How old was Ali when he accepted Islam? Six? Eleven? Fourteen? Nine. Nine. Many different narrations. But the conclusion. He was a boy, a young boy, nine years old. What is that? Elementary school? Not even, he's not even a high school student. Rasulullah comes and tells him, I'm inviting you to Islam. What was the response? If you tell some young child, hey, come to me, come with me to the office. Well, hey, I want to teach you a verse. Say, yes, Hey, you're the man of the Prophet. Rasulullah, 40 years old. And he probably thought and told him, give me some time to think. He goes back and he opens up to his father, Abu Talib. As in other narrations, he didn't open up, he, didn't, he kept it secret for himself. Abu Talib found him praying and he said, Ma Qal inni Muhammad. Abu Talib is not a Muslim, but Ali ibn Abi Talib came to Islam. Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he told that to, to his father, he told him, Itba'ah innahu ala al-haq. You know what? Follow him. He's following the haq. Abu Talib couldn't follow for his own personal reasons. The same thing Rasulullah Sallam did with Anas ibn Malik. Anas, Anas ibn Malik, he served Rasulullah at the age of what? Ten years old. Rasulullah came to his ears. He told him a secret. He told him, don't tell anyone. لا تخبر به أحدا. Anas ibn Malik, who saw that? His mother, Umm Sulaim. She sees him. As Rasulullah left, she comes to Anas and she asks him, ما أخبرك رسول الله? What did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tell you? A young boy, just give him a candy, he will spit it for you. And as Ibn Malik, 10 years old boy, Wallahi, ma kuntu li ufshiya sirra Rasulullah. Wallahi, I would never expose the secret of Rasulullah. What? And the young boy smack him three times and he'll just say it. But this is how they built leaders. Today, at the age of 20 and 25 years old, 
and he's playing FIFA. <laughs> he spends his whole day on Minecraft and PUBG and Call of Duty. That's all what he cares about. And you expect a community to grow out of you? Absolutely not. When you, when you look at a sister or a girl, she comes to 20 years old and all what she cares about is to match the scar with the hijab with the shoes. And sit 20 hours just to get the trends and the makeup and all of that matching. What do you expect of an ummah to come out? Of course, there will be a one-man show. And once the man leaves, the ummah collapses. Those are important lessons for us to reevaluate the priorities, to put Allah as a destination, to feel the obligation and the responsibility on your shoulders. And, and more importantly, to take off your mask. I would like to conclude with that, because many of us has fake faces today. How many masks do we have? How many personalities do you have inside of you? Three, mashallah, that's a right answer. <laughs> oh, bro, you're a pie teller or something. <laughs> but that's true. Three different personalities inside of each, each one of us. Islamically and psychologically. There is what we call al-fitrah. And this is, we'd like to call it today, the personality that Allah wants you to be. This is the default personality that you are born with. Kullu <coughs> ibn Adam, you let al there was one fixed personality that Allah has created you with. Then, some external changes will come and form a second personality for you. And that's your parents and the community will come and tell you, hey, what, a, what kind of very boring personality are you? All what you do is just memorize Quran and come to the masjid and attend the halaqat. Bro, just come and hang out with us. We're having a party this weekend, inshallah, I think. 17, having fun, huh? Get a couple of shots, get it wasted. Probably not going that far. We're just having shisha, right? I try this. Inshallah, bro, that will just put you in a different mood. Some weed, marijuana, just take you some high, cloud nine. That's why you look. You try to form another personality. That personality is not to please Allah, but to please others. And the only way you will merge and find satisfaction through applying to those people. Some sister will be abiding the laws of Allah. And she's just on the path, but she doesn't click with the group of people that she's around. She has to take off her head out. She has to look cool. Uh, you have to go on TikTok and, and do all the nastiness and the filthiness and post it out. Why? To please others. So there is a personality that Allah wants you to be. A personality that the community and the people around you wants you to be. And then a personality that your nafs wants you to be. Nafs is desired and built to follow its own temptations. Every one of us has his own desires that your nafs is telling you. Yeah, actually try this. Just try it. I'm not telling you. And again, with the that, shaitan comes in. Brothers, shaitan is not in the nightclubs and the dusks. Shaitan is standing. Shaitan on the doors of the masjid. Shaitan, this is why the same, the same goes on. If, uh, if shaitan doesn't come to you, you know you're doing something wrong. Uh -huh. Why? Because your mind will always be after you, having also the strong affection of your nerves to lead you astray. And your nerves is full of desires that it wants to steal, it wants to fornicate, it wants to cheat, it wants more pleasure and immediate temptations, even if it was temporary. Now you will ask yourself, who am I? The answer to that, the more the gap is stretched and lengthened between your nafs and the community and Allah, the more troubles and mental illness and struggles internally that you will have in yourself. And the more the gap is reduced between yourself and 
the community, and Allah, the more you will have the peace. And this is the promise of Allah when He said, وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ وَيَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَلَنُحِيَّنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبًا Whoever believes in Allah, his personality is Allah. And he does the good deed, he forces himself, that's his personality. مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى He brings the male and female, which forms a picture of a community and people around you. وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ This is the person who would find his ultimate peace and trouble. But what happens today? You find people using, and shaitan is a creative, ya khwan, ya I had a long journey with the shaitan. A long journey. That he mixes all of them together. You would find a brother indulging in a haram relationship. He's texting her, chatting with her, and probably before coming to the masjid, hey babe, I'm coming to Shaykh Abdul Qa'an's like a <laughs> I'm here, are you here? And you ask him, what are you doing, brother? This is haram. Ah, but your sheikh, she brings me closer to the masjid. She brings me closer to hellfire with a VIP access. But what shaitan managed to do is to make the personality of your nafs matches the personality of Allah. And he persuaded it, he painted it for you. That you and your girlfriend are having the beautiful connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah. Beautiful, isn't it? That's what he does. And today, this is the religion of Iblis. What's wrong if you be a gay and a Muslim? There is no any difference. Listen, there is no conflict. What's wrong with the Imam? I just saw that video, Allah, and one of the brothers sent it to me that a gay Imam was leading prayers in Australia. <laughs> And he gives a khutbah about tasamah and openness and easiness. And this is the base of religion. Those people are the worst danger in our religion. Because they're trying to put the three personalities, the personality of the shaitan and the personality of the corrupted community and the personality that Allah wants you to be all in one. And as long as you're not harming anyone, Allah is pleased with you. But you have to divide the three of them. You have to understand that in the Havad Dina Mateen, the Deen of Allah is very clear. The Deen of Allah doesn't have any fogginess. And the personality of Allah is different than the personality of your nafs for sure. Now, what leads you to have, and I will conclude with this, inshallah, before Salatul Isha, the environment around you. Our brothers, they gave a very beautiful example that I would like to share it with you. One of my dear friends in Saudi Arabia, they go out to Tabliq, not anymore, but in the previous days. And you know how those people are. This, like, they never give up. They will keep knocking your door until you wake up and come out to them. They don't care. You smash the door in their face, they will come the next, the next morning. So they go out to one of the brothers, they knock the door. And they say, Salaamu Alaikum, who he came from the masjid. He says, listen, I know who you are. I know what you're doing. And let me just make it easy. It's not that I don't come to the masjid. I don't even pray. Ya Akhi, just come. I don't pray, Ya Akhi, to khalas. Give up on me. He said, let's make a deal. Come with us to the masjid and don't pray. You said that you don't pray. <laughs> just come with us. He comes to the masjid. Deal is deal. We said, I'm not praying. So the leader of the Jama'ah, his name is Abu Ibrahim, he tells his group, chat with him, open discussions with him about everything except Salah. Let's just keep our word, please. When we pray, don't you ever tell them make wudu and pray. They come to the masjid, they stop talking and chatting, a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. And as the Maghrib started, and everyone is praying, and people are entering and just looking at him this way. And Everyone is giving him that look of an eye. Like, okay, what's wrong with you? Are you good at the edge? Are you a camera? Are you? Are you? <laughs> what are you? No one spoke with him, but he felt something that forced him to go down, make wudu, and join the prayer. <laughs> Salatul Maghrib is over. They come back to him. They're chatting, they're talking, they're having that cup of tea, cup of coffee. Salatul Isha comes. 
The first one on the line is this man, is standing and praying. They came to him after Salat al Isha, they asked him, What happened? You broke the deal. We said you're not going to pray. You pray by yourself. He said, Yeah, I know what was the secret. I was hanging out with people where it is embarrassing to pray. And when I came to the masjid, I was around people which is embarrassing not to pray. SubhanAllah. Wallahi, that opened dimensions for me. Ya ilahi, how the environment can flip your personality upside down. Just the environment. Tell me who your friend is. I tell you who you are. That's for real. So one of the greatest, greatest goals that you need to change is the environment. And once that happens, your whole destination will change. And the one thing that I always bring from the story of Ibrahim, Musa alayhi salam, when he said, I am the knowledgeable, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to change that mentality of arrogance that Musa had. I am the most knowledgeable. Okay, I will change. Why? Because he was hanging out with Ben Usra'in. Allah changed his environment. And he told them about man who will teach him lesson and lessons of destiny. When the people of the cave, the people of the cave, and everyone has to run back to his cave. You're too busy and invested in your life, brother. That you have to take a step and come back. If our fitya to be fitya, they were not one or two or three, they were a group of people. Fitya to be And when Allah wanted to give them the rahmah and the guidance, what did he do? He did not wake them up and tell them the environment changed. Now that gives you two messages. Either you change the environment, or you find an environment that will change you. That's the final message that I would like to conclude. Last but not least, have that sense that Ya Allah use me. Ya Allah, I'm there for you. You know when when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down to Musa and he tells him, Hey Musa, I made you for me. Doesn't that make you feel a bit jealous? You are mine. And I, I've put you on, on this earth in Calgary for me. Ya Allah, you see. And once you have that in mind, Allah. You will find yourself being used, but you have to be in an environment that will make that change. Why do we have hundred? How many people made Hajjat al Wada with Rasulullah? How many? 10,000? 12,000? Rasulullah died, and there was almost a hundred thousand Sahabi believing in him. But how many Sahabis do we know? If I told the most knowledgeable man among us here, count me the most, the, the most amount of names that you have in your mind, you would barely manage to count 10, 20, 30, to the best of your counting 50. Why? Those were the changing factors. Those were the dynamo of the community. The rest of them, there were Sahabis, they would fight in battles, mashallah, fantastic. But they're not changing, change. They're not. Makers, difference makers. They were not every day around Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And I always say, in order to be part of that change, you have to be part of the environment. As you come every day to the masjid, as you pray in the first lines, you would witness the change. You would find that there is, there is activities here. There are board members here. There is elections here. There is this and this and that. I want to be part of it. And then when you knock the doors, we might send you back. You know what? We don't have time for you. And then this one should keep pushing you forward. You don't expect the doors to be open and the red carpets to be fought for you. Absolutely not. You will find the doors closed, but you will be insisting, Ya Allah, you say. And you, buy, you become a part of this community that you will be missed as you leave. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Man lam yahmil hamma al-deen, kana ala al-deen yahmma. 
whoever does not carry the burden of deen, he himself is a burden on the deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us carriers, those who carry the burden of the deen wherever they go. And, and my wasiyah, my will to every one of us, whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put me back in his community or didn't, because, because I'm attached to brothers and sisters. Wallahi. Attached with people who, uh, who were chosen by Allah and by myself. I was not planning to take that place. I was not planning to hold that mic when I first came to Calgary. But Allah has chosen me. And when I was sleeping and coming and dragging, and I can remember myself with my corolla dragging my two pieces of luggage, with my mattress on my shoulder, coming down to the basement to sleep there for almost a third of my time in Calgary. I didn't imagine that a beautiful community would be built out of that. That bonds and attachment and love will be founded out. That wasn't in my imagination, but Allah has fashioned it. And all what we need to bring and create leaders in this community that makes this community vibrant. Who cares if this Imam goes and leaves and stays? Alhamdulillah, the masjid is alive. My wasiyah is this masjid stays alive, stays vibrant. It, it, it's just alive. Not with anything, even if there's no lectures, no events, but with the people who come. Because they have one destination, Allah. They have one goal to please. They have one personality which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which, which brings all of them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, last but not least, I said that four times already. Jazakumullah <laughs> khairan for all the, uh, the love. Uh, that you have showed me, and I don't certainly deserve it. And Alhamdulillah, that Allah showed you the beauty of myself and has covered the ugliness and filthiness of myself. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would expose my sins to you, not a single one would be shaking my hand. As the poet says, Wallahi, law alimu qadiha salirati, la abas salamu alayya man yalqani. Every one of us has his own sins, but Allah chooses to cover him. And this is why act, act with everyone. This is a beautiful Moroccan saying that says, treat everyone as if he is wali, wali min awliya You don't know about this person next to you. He might be the most beloved person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're thinking high of yourself and you're not even close to Allah as he is. Allah has exposed his sins to you. But he didn't expose his repentance to you. You didn't see his sincere tear as it was dropping from his eyes and coming down and made Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves him more than anyone on earth. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep all of us united, gathered. And as he gathered these beautiful faces in the south, in the of the Calvary, we will be gathering at the khatib and the speaker of this ummah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be giving us a speech. I'm having uh, a final touch of the flu. So uh, I would like to request no kisses or hugs, inshallah. But I would love, inshallah, to say salam to everyone. Uh, and I wish, I wish that Allah keeps using us and never replaces us. This is my dua daima. Allahumma istakhdimna wa la tastabdilna. Oh Allah uses and never replaces us. And don't you ever leave a place where Allah uses you, except for somewhere else where Allah will be using you as well. This is a final advice that everyone should keep in mind. And if you're not used yet, just wait for your time. It will come. As Rasulullah was prepared for 40 years, for 40 years, he was not yet used, but he was prepared. And I bet that many of you in the preparation stage, the problems, the buckles that you're having with your parents, your family, the community, the students, the friends, all of those are just signs Allah is telling you, you have to deal with them. Because a higher position is waiting for you. Ameen, ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullah khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanahu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanahu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa salamu alaikum wa salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah, 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 Allah,
 1.